Welcome final expense agents and brokers to the most popular audio training and podcast in the industry, The Lead Jerk Show, where we cut through the red tape and give you only the best in expert interviews. So strap in and grab a cold beverage and get ready to learn and earn. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you to the one and only Matt Lowry, also known as The Lead Jerk. All right, everybody, we've got Brad Aiden on the podcast today with 360 Financial Group. Um, this is Matt Lowry with TheLeadJerk.com. That's www.TheLeadJerk.com. Uh, today we're going to be discussing a little background on Brad, where uh, he came from, how he got into business, and what he does on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, We'll talk a lot about leads and uh, just some general things as far as the final expense business goes in general. So, guys, this was a really great interview, and uh, sit back and enjoy. Thanks. All right, everybody, we're here with uh, Brad Aiden, and he is uh, the head honcho there at 360 Financial Group. And Brad, I want to uh, thank you for being here today. I know you've got a lot going on, as, as well as a lot of us do, and uh taking the time to put out some uh, great information about what's been going on and what's coming up. And if you could, could you give us a little bit of a um, little intro about yourself, maybe, um, you know, uh, website information, content information. Obviously, I would like people, you know, come this way if they need anything because I know you've got so much going on. But um, And then maybe a little brief history about how you actually got exposed and entering the uh, finance business and how it's uh, worked out for you. Absolutely, Matt. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me today. Um, you know, it's always good to talk with people. You know, that are out there in the business that are are really getting after it, and also trying to kind of help train and mentor. You know, people like I know you do on you know adequate lead flows and field training and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I'm uh, definitely happy to uh, happy to chat with you. You know, kind of about everything we're doing and. Uh, you know, just kind of where, where we see things headed here in the, you know, in the near term and also in the long term. But, um, you know, it's really kind of an interesting uh, thing. I am the, the president of 360 Financial Group. Um, and, you know, the business really, you know, we I started my insurance career fully in about 2007. Um, I actually was licensed back in 1991 for a couple of years, right when I got out of college. But you know, I found trying to uh, teach people to buy term and invest the difference as a 21-year-old kid was kind of an uphill battle. Right. You know, back in uh, back in 1991, I date myself a little bit there, but you know, folks that were around back then realized that buying term insurance wasn't really a big positive back then. Mm -hmm. uh, it was kind of a it was kind of a dirty little thing that you know people did. Everybody else was trying to tell the middle class to go out and just buy and buy as much whole life as they could, and. You know, it was a tough thing for me because we had no leads, and it was just like your warm market, and as a 21-year-old kid, I ran out of that pretty quick. Maybe I wasn't tough enough. So, uh, you know, so I went down a different path. You know, always stayed in, in sales, and then later on, sales management, and, uh, you know, I'd owned a mortgage brokerage, and I'd done that for about five years. And coming into about uh, the end of 2006, it started to look like things didn't look too good. I was kind of seeing some warning signs of underwriting changes and things like that. And I thought, right. man, this, this has been a good run. But, uh, boy, this isn't looking too good. And you know, I had some friends that were also in that business that were feeling the same way. And one of them had stumbled across somebody that was out selling simplified issue term insurance to new mortgage holders, what you and I would commonly call mortgage protection. Right. And I, I kind of looked at what he was doing, and I, it honestly kind of, uh, it turned my stomach a little bit to think about being a life insurance agent. Because, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like you have this preconceived notion. Even though I've been licensed in 91, it wasn't a great experience then. Mm -hmm. And we we're kind of fed what we think a life insurance agent is or what it means to sell life insurance. But what it really boiled down to to me was at that moment I thought, man, I, I got to feed my family. So what, what else am I going to do? I love owning my own business. And it looks like you can get these. There's these things called leads mm -hmm. that you can get where you can go out and meet with people that actually have raised their hand and said they show an interest in this. And I thought, well, now there's a similarity. Because my mortgage business was that way. You know, we, we worked leads there. And I thought, okay, I'm going to get my license and I'm going to go out and do this. And I'll tell you what, it wasn't, but after a couple of weeks of having my license and being on some leads, 
were old leads. You know, they weren't fresh leads. But I'll tell you what, I saw real quick. I thought, man, this is unbelievable. Like, nobody has enough coverage if they have, or, or they don't have any coverage. Right. And they desperately need it. We're all going to die. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, I figured out it was more about what the insurance does for families than it was about what I thought it meant to be a life agent. Right. And once I wrapped my mind around that, man, I thought, where's this been my whole life? And and started down a path of trying to, to understand the business. Um, I had a really hard entry into the life business as as many people actually have right. in the past, especially back then. There wasn't as much uh, discussion online amongst people. Right. Um, everybody just kind of got led to the group they were working with through, like I did. It was through a personal interaction with somebody I knew from another business. Right. And that's how I got into the business. So, you know, I stumbled around for, for a good six to eight months and really was trying to figure out the business and how it worked and what the structure of it looked like. And, and how to succeed. And during that time, I was still putting together good production numbers. And and what I saw was that, you know, there was a there was a tremendous need out there for a safe place for people that just wanted to go out and make a living selling insurance. Because there were so many outfits that didn't necessarily have the agent's best interest in mind. It's kind of old boys club. Right. And I didn't see a lot of, of kind of cutting edge groups that were really trying to put together fair contracts, good training lead programs. It was more kind of, uh, I don't know, agent centric, you know, for lack of a better word, but it really was focused on the agent, developed by an agent for those agents. And, and as I started to have discussions with other agents I was working with, you know, a lot of those people were having those same thoughts, like, man, there's got to be a better way. So I just really kind of a bootstrap type program um you know it was ride a lot of business build up some production gain higher contract levels and then i realized there were a lot of people out there that were in a similar situation than i was they're out there working on a 60 70 80 point contract and they were also looking for better contracts better access to leads and that's really how the recruiting started it was really just more of an organic thing Mm-hmm. And and offering people a better option than where they were, and that was kind of where it started in the beginning, trying to get people in a better spot than where they were. Because at that time, I didn't have the best contracts. Right. I was working my way. I had better than they had, but I didn't have really what I would consider, you know, a top, you know, national marketing or, or IMO level contract. I was just a guy with a handful of agents. Right. And, you know, from that, you know, we kind of just did more of that and, and got to where we are today and really tried to grow that into being not just putting people in a better position than where they currently were, but when they came in, making sure that you could always have them in the best possible position that they could ever be in when it comes to contract leads training and all focused on the agent. So. Um, so that's kind of here where we sit some, I don't know, I guess what's been nine years later. Right. And, you know, that's kind of how it, uh, kind of how it progressed. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. And it seems like, you know, 20 years ago it was really, like you said, it was really fragmented. I mean, there was no, um, you know, tip of the spear type of programs in place to, to, to really help a lot of people that were, you know, looking for whether either mortgage protection or to, um, you know, initiate some kind of final expense uh, program out in the market. It's just, from what I've read up and oh. saw, you know, it was kind of like people just had to kind of, agents had to figure it out as they went along. Oh, it was. It's totally agents figuring out as they go along. And, you know, what really has changed things, I mean, to me, what's, what's been the game changer for a lot of people, you know, as a salesperson my whole life, up until about 2000, when I entered the mortgage business, I was a terrible prospector. Mm. Some people are really good at it. You know, we all know those people. You might be one of those people. They, everybody they talk to, they're always talking about their business, trying to sell them and get referrals. And like, <laughs> yeah. they just, it's just the way they are, man. 
man. They'd be standing in line at the grocery store trying to sell somebody, whatever it is. Right. Insurance or refinance a mortgage or a cell phone or, like, that's just the way they are. They're and always at the me, networking groups. Same guy, always there. Always, yep. always doing that kind of stuff. And, you know, for me, I, I was always... I always did a good job when I was sitting in front of somebody that I knew there was a need and, you know, there was going to be some selling that was going to go on. It was going to be a lot of fun. I was going to love the experience and so were they. But, man, going out and finding those people all day long, I was found to be kind of a drag. And and what, what changed is when you have the ability to generate a group of people that had already shown an interest in a particular product or service, like for me, and probably this isn't for everybody, but for me, like that was something that was different. So I could then start working with those 20 or 30 or 40 people every week that already shown some kind of interest. No, they weren't ready to just buy. And that's where the selling comes in. But at least we knew they had some interest when they filled out whatever type of reply card or, or telemarketing program or whatever it was. And, you know, but it, I'll tell you the other side of that is though it's kind of made us all a little lazy in that we've also all become a slave to leads. That's true. <laughs> you know, we're not doing much good old fashioned uh, prospecting. Um, you know, like the old Frank Becker book. I think it was How I Raised Myself from Failure to Success in Selling. You know, like it wasn't about working leads. Right. Prospecting and, and working your warm market and making yourself a center of influence, all those kind of things. So um, so I think it's made us lazy, but I also think it's made us ultimately more productive if you've got yourself dialed in <clears throat> to a consistent, solid lead program. Absolutely. You know, that's the, that's the thing. So that's a, that's a key component in our business, obviously, and I see it as a a key component in really almost every single final expense agent that I've ever come across that's having success is on some type of a lead program. Yes, there are a couple of outliers, um, more so in the in the inner city. You've got a few, you've got a handful of people mm-hmm. that just do a lot of word of mouth and door knocking and and having tremendous success. But I wouldn't say that that's that that agent is one in a thousand. Right, maybe. So if we're going to focus on the rest of the folks that are out there, generally it's tied to some kind of elite program. Right. And that kind of ties into your your uh, famous three things that, you know, kind of that you've seen from dealing with thousands of agents um, that make them successful. And those were, uh, you know, I think you've mentioned, you know, field training, leads, and, yep. and, and work that ethic. So could you, could you touch on each one of those for us, Brad? Absolutely. Um, you know, I get calls daily from new agents that are wanting to know, you know, they might have read something online or heard something from another agent, you know, saying, hey, I'm trying to you know, figure out how to enter this final expense business. You know, what do you have? What can you offer? What should I do? And I really do think it, it boils down to those three things you just said. It's proper field training a consistent lead flow, and most important of all of it is a, is a, a work ethic, which a lot of us that are self-employed, you know, we kind of take that for granted, but we forget that a lot of people that are entering this business, you know, they might not have the strongest work ethic, and if they don't, and if they know that about themselves, that they're just, they're just about half lazy, they really should just try to do something else. Yeah. Yeah. Because while it is a simple business, it, it does take a lot of self-discipline to get up, grab your leads, go to work, knock on doors, call people. You know, there is still work involved. It's, it's not something that's going to do itself. But, uh, you know, starting with the first one, the, the proper field training, my preference for all new agents either to the insurance business in general or to final expense specifically I really prefer the agent to be field trained by another highly successful agent. And I don't really mean over the telephone mm-hmm. or through their website right. or anything else. Some of that's a nice starter, but I really prefer, you know, we've got this crazy thing called an airplane, uh, right. you know, or, or a car, 
and it sounds crazy, and I'm making a, a little bit of a joke, but I mean, you know, you can be to a highly successful trainer in about a two-hour flight. Right. It's, it's cheap to fly. You're self-employed. Or if you don't want to fly, you know, hop in your car and go drive and see somebody. But I really like somebody to, to go and ride with somebody for a couple of days, see what the life of a final expense agent is like. You know, see what it's like to book appointments. See what it's like to ride along. You get to ask a ton of questions while you're there. I mean, it is invaluable. And, you know, but it also does two things. It's, it's a two-way street. It is not only are are you taking the initiative to go and do that, but the person that is then your field trainer knows something about you. They know that you are committed to the process. You got out of your comfort zone. You hopped in your car and drove six or eight hours. Right. <laughs> or, you, or you went to the airport and flew yourself down there, and they know, guess what? You're also serious. You don't just want to sit on the other end of a phone and talk somebody's ear off for hours on end about how you're possibly going to ever get started in this business. <laughs> right. initiative. And I think that it helps build that bond. And and that bond, in my experience, that's, that's the preferred way. So you go out, you get yourself field trained. It's not the only way, but it's the preferred way. Uh, there are workarounds, but I don't like to focus on those. I'd rather tell people what's the absolute best way because there's a ton of money at stake, and we can talk about that a little bit later maybe. Right. Um, this, is serious, this is serious business that we're talking about. Yeah. It's serious income. So. It is. And you pick up so much from riding with somebody. I mean, oh, you, just, you, absolutely. Just, you pick up, uh, I mean, hundreds of more little idiosyncrasies and things that go on during the course of, of the whole the whole array of final expense. So, yeah, I can see where, you know, that's, Absolutely. to me, that's very important. You know, and the funny thing is, and, and this is, you know, we're all, you know, everybody that's having success in this business is self-disciplined or there wouldn't be success. But, you know, the other funny thing, we're also all still human. And what, what I see is among the people that are also doing the field training with us, they find that their performance is actually higher when they're field training. Yeah. And when they're out on yeah. their own, yep. because they don't cut corners. They <laughs> right, don't right, the, yeah. They don't take the easy on, the easy off ramps. They're like, hey, this guy just drove eight hours to ride with me. Am I going to show him how to just take the first off ramp and get out of here and we'll go Starbucks and have a cup of coffee while we wait to go to the next one? Right. Or am I just going to dig in and just see what happens and make this a teaching experience, whether we win or we lose on the sale? We're at least going to, you know, explore all options here, and I think it, it, it actually, it, it actually kind of helps people. I think elevate their game in in many instances. But, I do too, yeah. Um, but you know, so, you, so you've got to have the field training in, in some way, shape, or form. The next, the next thing would be you got to have a consistent lead flow that a person's going to be dialed into. So. Mm-hmm. You know, for the most part, we're talking about two types of leads for face-to-face agents, and that would be either direct mail leads, which is where I would estimate about 90% of the businesses generated in the country based on direct mail. Bread and butter is where the money is, yep. Yep, absolutely. absolutely. It's been that way for a long time. Yep. So it's going to be that way for a long time in the future for, for many reasons. That data is going to run out, and you have to uh, switch areas. So yeah, it's it's you know you have to you have to be careful with that and make sure you you, you got that right. It, absolutely, it's a, it's a great tool. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a wonderful thing. They're very responsive prospects. I mean, there's nothing wrong with the leads, and the leads are inexpensive. It's just a matter of consistency 
see over the long haul, right. it's almost impossible if you're generating your leads legitimately to do that. Right. Um, the third, the third uh, type of lead I'll, I'll touch on because people may wonder or wonder why I didn't talk about it. There are internet leads. Yeah. Uh, but, the, but the challenge is geography. Um, most final expense agents that are having success, if you took a poll of people all across the country or if you go online or if you see agents online that are talking about final expense, the majority of that final expense is being sold in rural areas. It is. For the yeah. most part. Not all, but, but again, we're talking about the 80%, 90%. And you can't generate enough internet leads. No. Yeah, you'd have to cover a whole state in order in, in some states to have twenty leads a week. And it's just because there aren't enough people online yet looking for final expense themselves. So while they are great leads, if they're available in a person's particular area, there's just not enough volume there. So that always is driving us back to to the direct mail program. Mail. So first yep. Yep, you gotta be on a steady program. You gotta be on at least twenty leads a week. Uh, we have agents working anywhere from 20 leads a week to I don't have anybody currently ordering over 50 leads a week. But we have many agents in the 40s, but nobody over 50. 50 seems to be kind of the right. diminishing return line. You can't <laughs> almost physically work more than that. Oh, yeah. Um, but uh, but you've got to have that. And then once you've got your lead flow and you've been trained, it goes back to that work ethic. And, you know, when we launched the lead program about three years ago, it, was, it gave us a little bit of a false sense of, of reality in that almost all of the agents that were coming to us wanting to get on a lead program were already pretty successful final expense people. Mm-hmm. And man, it was plug and play. Right. You put in a lead order, four weeks later, leads come out, agents are happy, everybody's making money, nobody leaves the lead program because they think it's the best thing they've ever seen. And it's just one right after another after another. And you get rolled into the sense of thinking that everybody succeeds until you realize that those people already knew how to write final expense and they already had a strong work ethic. They right. were looking for maybe a little better contract and a little little less expensive lead. But that doesn't necessarily translate to new people entering the business that maybe aren't tough enough to get through some of those initial challenges and decide that this is the time in their life that they're going to take charge and go out there and make it happen for their family. So that work ethic is hard, um, but that also goes back to um, when you're riding along with somebody or you're being mentored by somebody, you find out real quick, those people work hard. And if that scares someone, you know, again, there's there's other things to go do where you can just punch a clock and, you know, hope not to get fired, but this wouldn't be it. Right. Um, you know, as, as good as it is. So, those are the three main things. Anything you think I've left out there? No, I think it was great. Also, to touch on the internet leads. I mean, like you said, I think they're. You know, I've I've heard they're they're pretty good. It depends on you got to be careful about what you're ordering online. You know, obviously there's, you know, there's companies out there that are selling agent, and then they'll sell ten other agent stuff, and then there's a few that we know that are they're pretty good. But it it, yeah. it comes oh. back to that price point too. Um, if I'm looking at a, a Thirty to a thirty-five dollar internet lead. Well, I w- personally, I would rather take that money and and have a, a direct mail lead. Um, I, I agree. You know, it's a great point, Matt. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I don't want people also be um, misled about internet leads. Right. There are maybe one or two people in America mm-hmm. that are generating a true, legitimate final expense lead. By that, what do I mean? I mean, the person that filled out the response card was looking at an ad online talking about they want to buy a funeral insurance plan, a burial insurance plan, a final expense plan to pay for their funeral and burial. That's a final expense lead. What's not a final expense lead is the person happens to be between the age of 50 and 80, and they want to buy life insurance. (laughs) Right. Now, I'm not saying you can't sell that person insurance. Sure you can. But you're going to have to be well-versed in all kinds of, of uh, GULs, term coverage, other whole life products. You don't know what you're walking into. That is not really a great lead for somebody that got their license last week. And 
and it's going to be hard to convert it. And all of those leads are resold over and over and over and they over are. and over and over again mm, by all the big lead yeah. aggregators. So I don't care what anybody tells you. It's not an exclusive lead on that type of lead because the aggregators are then selling it to resellers. And then those people sell to a reseller. And the next thing you know, that lead you think is exclusive has already been sold to 30 other people. Yeah, and those aggregators and, don't care, Brad, because they're not no. part of any IMO group. They have no tie to the agent. They don't care. No. You know? None. None whatsoever. Uh, none, none whatsoever. So, um, so no, I'm glad, you, I'm glad you brought that up. I don't want people to think, hey, I should just go out online and see if I can find final expense. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> it's just, just a good way to waste money. It is. Um, you know, I just I wish it wasn't that way, man. I wish everybody had a smartphone or internet access, and we just go search online for coverage because it would make it would make it pretty easy. It would save us all a lot of money in mail. Yeah, it would. We're that, we're that readily available, <laughs> but you know, it's just just the way it is. Well, let me ask you this. Um, let's see, that I have this on here or not? I'm gonna let me go ahead and mention this um, before I ask you the next question. Uh, something else I thought was really important, though. And this is from, coming from me personally. That's that I, I've been with a couple of different groups, and I'm, you know, happy to say that this is the best I've ever done, and and this is the the tightest group uh, that I've seen. And the reason is number one, all the three things that you just mentioned. But something else that people need to realize is carrier selection. Okay, because you can have, you know, you can find there's groups out there that have direct mail programs. Okay. Um, they're not as good as ours, but um, they limit you on carrier selections. The the thing about 360 and 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 the way our our uh, program is put together, there's no reason to really need anything else. I mean, you're not going to be as limited. I mean, if you run into a competitive situation, and you're like, oh, I really wish I had that carrier, but you know. I've got to write. I need to write my business with with the group that's you know got me with this lead program. Number one, just for respect. Number two, it's the right thing to do. <clears throat> um, you know, to me, that is huge. That's that's uh that's riding right along with uh, the importance of a, of the lead program, but then also having the carriers to place people with. Can you touch on that a little bit? Because I think some people don't really think about that sometimes when they're looking is. They don't realize, yeah, I could go over here, but man, you know, if, if, if you are limited on your carriers, as a lot of these other companies are, at, you know, four or five companies, and that's it, <clears throat> you're, it makes it tough, even tougher for somebody new. I, I totally agree, man. And you know, what that goes back to, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, because sometimes I, I take for granted that that's the way that we're doing it. Mm -hmm. Um you know, I, I will tell you, having that kind of a strategy, it does come at a significant cost to the bottom line, not for the agent, but for us as a marketer. Right. Because we let agents, we don't dictate what carriers you're going to write. Now, we will ask that if you're on the lead program, yeah, we get 100% of your final expense business. Right. 100% of your contract if you're on lead. That's just the way it is. Right. I don't really have any interest in supporting people with leads that are writing business through some other group. It just doesn't make sense to me. And leads are in such limited supply in most markets. We've got to be able to capitalize on that, or we might as well just have just uh, recruited another agent there. Right. But but that goes back to the kind of the, the way the company was started, the way that I think as an agent, first and foremost, before I ever think about you know, what do I think about as a marketer to agents? But what do I think about as an agent is that I always wanted to sell whatever I wanted to sell. I wasn't really a big fan of somebody else telling me to sell something else for their benefit. Mm -hmm. And and because of that, you know, we've contracted with just about everybody in the final expense business that an agent should need to have. And, 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 we've, and it's kind of a kind of that way for two reasons you know first and foremost we release every agent every single time that's ever asked for a release if they find that the relationship isn't going the direction they want hey they're free to go move and do whatever they want to do right. so so if we're willing to do that and they can always leave and go somewhere else if they're not happy then while they're here they ought to be able to write whatever they want to write right and and we could make twice as much money 
dictating people to go right. Three carriers. Right. Why is that? Because we would dictate the three carriers with the largest margin. Right, right. The largest spread between the agent's commission and the company commission are the three companies who would tell everybody, hey, you can make a go of it with these three companies. Yeah. <laughs> Heck, there, there are people out there working with companies like Lincoln Heritage that write one company. Right. And they write plenty of business. So, hey, you go write these three, and this is the way it is on the lead program. Yeah, maybe it's more profitable, but it just doesn't fit with the overall mentality of what it is we're trying to accomplish for for oftentimes the consumer and trying to get them a fair deal and also with the kind of the psyche of the agent thinking about you know what is it that they want to write what may, what companies do they like working with sometimes it's the cheapest premium sometimes it's because they just happen to like a particular company and maybe the company answers the phone when they call in and they can help change a billing date exactly or they can help give them new new bank information. It can be little things, but but again, that's the agent's call. You know, we are training people to be independent agents. We're not training them to be sheep. And just cool. follow along yeah. whatever we tell them to go do. We're training to be independent business people. So, you know, that's that's an important part of that. And you know, out of that has come. I jokingly say, I may have said to you in the past, you know, it's for that reason, we're the single largest marketer of final expense for a whole bunch of companies that a lot of people never even have heard of. Right. But it's because they're niche little companies that have got, they've got some really interesting wrinkles in their program, and the run-of-the-mill mainstream agent or mainstream marketer doesn't want to represent them because there's not enough margin, and or the company doesn't even want to deal with some gigantic conglomerate. Um, so, you know, it's for those reasons. It makes for a really great mix of carriers, though. It really does. It does. It makes it even more powerful, you know, with the program because, yeah. you know, you got, like you said, you got agents out there that are limited. Well, you know, <laughs> I can tell you from experience, <clears throat> you know when you run across that because you'll have somebody stuck in a, in a, in a, in a, product and you know obviously it depends on how long they've had it right but if you come across somebody and it happens a lot you know as people get in this they'll see if you come across somebody that's had some a policy for three to six months with one of those carriers that once you've been in this a while you know who they are and you know the agent probably only had two or three companies to pick from and they had to write them well you know you probably can get them better coverage at a better price and uh, easier company to deal with and it that's just sales flow from that so you know Absolutely. it's a liability you know, not having enough why, to write I think that's why we see Matt when we have and you've been on you've been on some of the trips oh yeah um, sometimes people see them called blitzes or whatever you want to call them yeah. where you know a group of agents that work with us and sometimes agents outside of the group that just want to come meet some of the guys that they've heard of in the yeah. industry yep everybody kind of flies into an area where, where we've got some excess leads that build up maybe there was an agent or a whole agent thinking those are dollar signs for me <laughs> yeah exactly not only can you help them but you're going to make some money doing it too absolutely you know? absolutely it's, it's totally a win-win so you know that's you know that that's definitely a part of it is, is having that mix and, and being able to to know how to replace a policy as long as you're putting the client in a better position yeah it's funny you mentioned the blitzes i think there's um those are always fun i'm probably going to be planning on heading up to Houston in about a month. There's some stuff going on up yep. there that's going to be pretty interesting. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Awesome we're, having, we're having a big shindig there with some of the, the best of the best uh, producers in the country, you know, along with 
some of the carriers right. that we really care about and and support. So it's uh, yeah, you're right. It's going to be it's going to be a pretty cool deal. So um, definitely a must go to for for people that are either want to check it out or people that are wanting to grow, um, you know, in their business and, and learn a little more about the business. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to it. Um, let's see. So you know. With every industry, there comes a lot of changes, but I mean, I, I, I feel like Final Expense is pretty steady. I mean, I don't see much coming along in changes um, in the next decade or so. I mean, there's going to be always little things here and there, but do you see any major changes coming in Final Expense on, on your end, Brad, in the next, say, 10 years? I mean, other than maybe technology moving forward or carriers maybe changing things here and there with the app yeah. process? That's what I was going to say. I, I, could, I could answer that question in two ways. One, do I think there are going to be minor changes? I think we're going to see more minor changes than you've ever seen in the past because what you've had happen here over the last uh, five years especially is you've got carriers that think they want to take a bite out of that <laughs> apple of the yeah. final expense business. Oh, yeah. And then they realize that they miscalculated or misjudged. Uh, maybe the rates were too low or the comp was too high or, you know, it's a pretty tough business yep. from the carrier's perspective. A lot of these policies aren't even making money for the carrier until month oh. 8, 9, 10, yep. 11, 12. Yep. And a lot of agents, I think, especially newer agents, even some seasoned agents, they totally, they totally lost on them that this isn't just some kind of cash cow to go roll out a new final expense product. It is a lot of times for us as the agent or agency, it can be phenomenal, but it doesn't mean that the carrier is going to make it because it not, might not be very well thought out. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to constantly see shifts in pricing and new carriers jumping in and jumping out of the market. And I think we have to all be used to that and ready for it. And it's another reason that it's very handy for us to represent 20 plus companies right. instead of three because... If any one of those companies decides tomorrow they're done, it really isn't a big deal to shift it to one of the other 19, and and it kind of kind of lessens the risk for the agent. It might not be fun to move from one of your core carriers if they decide to pull the plug on the business, um, but but it's not like it's a it's a huge deal. So I think in that sense there's going to be a lot of changes. I think overall I really don't foresee any big changes, and that's what always has me so fired up about the business because right. this isn't a flash in the pan, here today, gone tomorrow type business. And unfortunately, it's actually for not a very positive reason. Um, we've never seen in the history of our country more poor seniors. That's true. That's just the fact. Yeah. Um, people in their... You know, those, those baby boomers, they are in a far different position economically than their parents that were what I would call Depression era. Right. Depression era people, once they came through the Depression, they saved every nickel they ever had. Right. And a lot of those people went to their graves with pockets full of money, funerals already paid for, money in trust funds or, or CDs or IRAs, and... They were, you didn't know it to look at them. They might have lived in the same little old house they always lived in, but that house was paid for, and they had money in the bank, and they had, you know, a little money set aside. But, but those people's children, for the most part, you know, again, talking about the masses, for the most part, those people have lost their retirement savings. Right. Or they spent it on their kids. They can't manage to keep a job, and they've helped bail them out because they went through a housing crisis. That's or true. A yep. medical a medical challenge that bankrupted them, or, I mean, there's all kinds of things that have happened, and we've never seen that happen before, and, you know, every single day, a new person turns age 50 that doesn't have any insurance and doesn't have any savings, and I wish it wasn't that way. I mean, I really, I, I really, really do. I wish our jobs could be, instead of being in the final expense business, I wish we could be out seeing middle income and upper middle income seniors showing them how to take money out of their CD at a half a percent and put it into an annuity at 2%. Right. I wish that was our job. There's not that enough of them. A lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. But that isn't where we find
find ourselves. We find ourselves with the bulk of that market, not having much savings and, and not having any insurance coverage. And every single one of them is going to die at some point. Mm-hmm. And, and the other, the other kind of sobering truth is not only do they not have the savings, their children or grandchildren don't have it either. They absolutely don't. That's right. So if it was just one generation that didn't have money, and their children were doing really super well, they could just say, well, my kids are, you know, every one of my kids is a doctor or a lawyer. They'll take care of this. But what they find is their child might live in a little place next door. They don't have even as much as they do because they haven't, you know, they haven't got on Social Security. They're right. just, you know, kind of trying to get by. And so we see that happen over and over and over. So, no, I don't see the market changing at all in terms of the opportunity and the need. Um, will there be some changes in lead generation? I'm sure there will. Uh, you know, that that's going to shift and change as, as more and more people do go online or um, as direct mail just gets tougher and tougher mm-hmm. in, in some of these markets. Um, but the need, the need is never going to change. I know that, you know, one thing, too, that... <clears throat> It's not really a battle, it's more of a mindset, I guess. But, you know, like you said, we're all going to die, we're all going to pass away at some point. And kind of what we what, we're, what we deal with is, um, you know, easing that burden for people and their families. And I can't tell you the number of people, like you said, that are still actually having to, you know, take care of their kids. And in some cases, their grandkids or both. And, you know, you have the opportunity. Okay, so, yeah, what I was saying was... Um, you know, how we're able to, you know, we even see the ability to write kids and grandkids from their, you know, the seniors, you know, trying to help their family still after they're in their 70s, sometimes in late 70s, early 80s, you know. Absolutely, Matt. You know, I think what what happens far too often, especially when somebody's just kind of trying to figure out, you know, what is this final extent thing, we all spend so much time talking about how many leads do we need to get, how much average premium can we write per week? What kind of net profitability am I looking at after my first year, second year, third year? You know, all these things are all talking about this money being made and that money being made. And what everybody forgets is what is what are all those sales doing for the actual people and families that we serve? Because as I can tell you, with with every agent. have any headhunters that we work with that are trying to write $1,500 a year annual premiums ongoing, you know, every day, day in, day out, hoping it sticks. These are a bunch of agents out there writing, you know, annual premiums of, you know, five, 600 bucks, maybe 700 bucks on average. And it's, so it's all about how many families you serve, not about taking advantage of families to make more money. Right. And I think that gets lost. So what I find is that the agents that do have a heart for people, they're the agents that seem to do the best. And the agents that are just purely 100% money hungry, and that's all they care about, and nothing else matters, they don't seem to generally do very well. I'm not saying they can't make it, but they don't seem to do quite as well because they aren't willing to do what has to be done to go out and serve those people that oftentimes are in a pretty tough spot. And if you don't have a little bit of a heart for people, then it's kind of hard to stick that out year after year. Right. If, if, just, if it's just purely about the money, you'll eventually try to go sell something else that's maybe a little bit easier. All right, everybody. We're here. Right. And, and I think that's something important to bring up is that that really at the end of the day is really what it's about i mean like you said it can sound corny sometimes but i mean if you don't have you know 
I guess saying, you know, we, we deal with death so often um, in this business, and that's another thing. you got to kind of be able to, to, to have a strong mindset to get over that. I mean, it's not something that's really fun to talk about, right? You know, I don't like right. even thinking about it or talking about it. And, you know, I'll tell people when I'm sitting down with them, I, I absolutely don't like thinking about it, but it is what it is, and it's probably the most, the, you know, the highest level of maturity that uh, a human being can have is to realize that they're, you know, they're, they're going to they're gonna pass away one day. So, yes. you know, it's 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 not a fun thing, and, and, and I think it's important, too, for agents to have um, like-minded people they're around, and, you know, even with... Um, you know, on occasion we'll have the, the, the chat thing, the texting or whatever that, that we can do. Um, you know, that, that you know, it kinda it kinda lessens the uh, takes the edge off of that kind of stuff because, you know, that's that's pretty serious. I mean you have to you know, I don't know, I'm pretty sure other agents think about that. I do from time to time. So when when you're dealing with that day in and day out, it eventually you become somewhat numb to it. But then there's those days where you're like Wow, you know, I, you know, you spent all week and basically, you know, you just you just left your last poem for the week and you helped somebody out and they were a 75 year old, you know, little old lady that's got nobody, you know, and you just have to kind of. It's nice to be around other people that experience that too, so that you know, you know, you're not the only one that that deals with you know some of that stuff. Absolutely, man. I think it's I think it's just it's really. I think it's really helpful, yes, but to remember, like you said, you can't think about it every day, all day, because honestly, sometimes it would really bum a guy out. Yeah. If, if you really, really focused on the plight of the folks that you're working with every day, and you really did truly empathize more so than try to kind of get them over the hump to buy the thing that we all know they need to buy so they don't burden their family. So you do have to maybe have a little bit of a shell, but... I just always want everybody to to be really proud of at the end of the week or the month of the year when you're sitting there patting yourself on the back a little bit or you're staring at the you log in online look at your bank account and go man this is the best year I've ever had in any business I also wanted the back of that person's mind to think you know what I didn't have to step on anybody to get there right because there are a lot of businesses. I'm not saying it's bad for people to go out and just make money in other businesses. Whatever, man. It's a free country. You know, do whatever everybody wants to do. But, you know, if you could have both, if you could actually help people take care of a true, legitimate, very serious need and make a really nice living, I don't know. For me, it just feels right. So, you know, you don't have to apologize for what you did. I mean, hey, Bernie Madoff had a great life, too. Right. <laughs> You know, up, up until one bad day. Yep. And, you know, you don't have to have the shoe fall, you know, on that on that one bad day. Right. Good, good. Um, let me ask you about specifically, um, I know we've been talking about leads, but specifically what may be a good definition for some of the guys listening that may not know, you know, how different direct mail works, but specifically about the per lead program and how that differs from, you know, dropping your own mail um, and uh, some of the, some of the, um, you know, things you have to go through with that that's taken kind of off the agent's shoulders where <clears throat> a per lead DM program is kind of administered, you know, for them and they just need to make sure, you know, they're doing their part. Um, right. Can you explain a little bit about that, Brad, about how that works? Yeah, I, I will. Um, <clears throat> You know, I'll tell you, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about this over the last several years about how should the average agent go about generating their leads? Uh, should they just do their own mail, uh, you know, drop their own mail through, you know, a couple of different companies out there that are legitimate and then just take their chances on what returns come back, you know, or should they plug into a fixed price lead program like we promote where I would say 90% of our agents are on a fixed price lead program that are actually, you know, producing over a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. And, you know, I think there, there's some discussion about that. And, and I think what it really boils down to, and, you know, so much of what we do 
Matt, and this is something I really meant to touch on in the beginning that I didn't touch on it, is that, you know, as a company, we are nothing more than just kind of a compilation of some amazing agents and trainers. It's not the company that's awesome. I can assure you that, and I'm not being sarcastic or joking. It's not the company that's amazing. It's the people that are out there in the field and doing the training and pushing the ball down the field every day. That's what makes it interesting, and that's what makes it special. Because what we found is that over time, you know, when we started working the lead program a few years ago, we didn't have anybody ordering 40 or 50 leads a week. Right. Nobody was ordering 40 or 50 leads a week. Most people were ordering 20 or 25. And what we found is over time, you know, agents started working, you know, 20 leads a week and then 25. And then somebody stepped up to 30. And then they realized, boy, at 30, you almost hit a point of, once you know what you're doing, at 30, if you want to buy 50, you can because you got the cash flow to buy anything you want. Right. Uh, as long as there aren't other things in your life financially like an anchor that are dragging you down like huge child support problems or big tax lien problems you can't fix that but just day to day living expenses on 30 leads a week if you want to buy 50 and work 50 you can because you've got more money in your bank account than you've ever had in your life so what we had is we had several leaders started stepping it up and you know 35 leads and then 40 and what would 45 look like and and I'm not saying that's for everybody, but what happened is the agent knew they could count on what the price was going to be of their lead bill every single week. Exactly. To, to get to a 50 per week lead flow all on your own could require a pretty significant gamble. And, and time where, to figure out, to figure it out. Well, yeah, yeah. I just had an agent. I, I just had one of our most successful trainers and also a just stud in the field every now and then from time to time drops a little mail in an area that he sometimes gets leads in just to test the market and see how good or bad the return was right and and i think the average lead cost was in the i don't know end up being 70 80 buck range oh maybe. yeah i know i know what you i know you're talking about yep you know <laughs> it's just it's like Imagine if you just got in the business or you're just finding your way yeah. and and you go out and generate yourself some $70, $80, $90 leads, you're going to think real quick, like, this isn't for me. Right. I don't have the stomach for it and I don't have the budget for it. So what I, I'm not saying it's bad for agents to go generate their own leads. I personally don't care. Right. Uh, what I care about is that the agents that either I personally spend time with or the folks that we have out there that are recruiting and training are dealing with the people that everybody's spending their time with. I want to be with agents that are on a consistent lead flow 52 weeks a year. Right. And I don't care if they generate their own leads or they do the fixed price. Get yourself on a program every week of the year. And so what I've seen, though, is that the people we have that are out there writing you know, two, three, four hundred thousand, only one at five hundred thousand. Mm-hmm. Those people are all on fixed price leads for one. Do we think they're stupid? Nope. Do you think they write three hundred thousand dollars a year and think that you just fell off a turnip truck? <laughs> or do you just like having your leads there every Thursday? You like your bill being the same. And whether you pay twenty six dollars a lead or you sit there and think, boy, I wonder if I could have generated my own for 22. I wonder. Uh, no, you're, you're, you're not. You're thinking, hey, 26 is fantastic. Right. Um, actually, what most of them have done is they have they don't work a $26 lead. We've got a lot of people who work $35 leads. Yeah, why? I think mine said at 31 or 32, so yeah. I mean, yeah, why? Fine. Because they've decided, once you, like we said, once you get to 30, 30 leads a week generally, for the average agent, the pro could actually work a little less than that and still do really well. But right. say the average guy in the field or lady in the field, I say guy, I mean men or women. Right. I said that earlier. We've got a ton of women yep. that are tearing it up. 
and I love that too. Um, but what I would say is once you get to 30 leads a week, all of a sudden you can either decide to buy more leads or you might decide, well, you know what? I don't really enjoy sitting down with a bunch of 52-year-olds. Right. I think I want to go 58 to 76, and I'll spend a couple bucks a lead in order to do that. Or they might think, you know, I just, I'd like to weed out just a little bit of a few of those folks that are making six, seven, eight hundred dollars a month, and I'd like to sit with people that are making just a little bit more money. So I'm going to go income 15 to 60,000, a couple right. bucks. Why? Because they don't really care what their lead bill is. Right. They're just trying to micromanage it, and maybe they can eke out a little more productivity. And but I'm not saying it's the, the end all, or, you know, or that everybody should want to do that because we've got plenty of people that are still working the $26 lead and writing a ton of business. But that's that's their personal choice. So, you know, so I love the, the fixed price program because the agents love it. It's a chore to manage it. So in that sense, you know, it, it, it's not like it, it happens on its own. But right. It, but it's... <laughs> so important because we've seen the growth of the agents that are on a program. You know, we've seen those agents go from being a $100,000 a year producer to $200,000 a year producer to $300,000 a year producer because they're just kind of slowly growing their lead flow to get it to the volume that they wanted. And, you know, that, that goes back to it's just all about consistency. And I think everybody, I don't care who you talk to, Everybody universally agrees consistent lead flow is a critical component. Yeah, and, and, and you know, the time management too, Brad, like you said, I mean, it's it's administered <clears throat> a lot of, you know, I have an idea what it takes to do it, and I wouldn't want to do it. <laughs> and I think that the agents just, you know, I think to me, for my time, my time's more valuable, like just knowing, okay, Pretty much, they're going to be there every Thursday. What my lead bill is going to be every week, and they're there. Boom! And now it's time to get get the appointment set or go see them. You know, that's that's because <clears throat> I mean I know there's guys out there that still drop for a thousand and do great, and they do all that. Me personally, uh, and I could do it if I had to, but I just really I just really don't want to. You know what I mean? It's just it just makes more sense to just plug in to what's working and then and then uh, go to work. Well, yeah, because you can be profitable and you don't have to micromanage it. Right. Um, you know, and it was funny. I had a guy, you know, fairly early on in our growth, uh, I had a guy tell me that having the lead program was the biggest mistake we'd ever make. <laughs> that it was not something that a person should want to do. It's too much work. It's too much headache, and it's much, much easier to just let agents go do their own thing so you don't have to mess with them and let them go write their own business and don't spend the time and effort to manage a lead program because it's just too much work. And I, while part of that is true, it is a lot of work and a lot of headaches and a lot of frustration, but it's worth it. Right, because it helps people get to that consistency, and they're also then dialed into that flow, and it's it's one of those things where it's just easier to just keep forging ahead, and part of it goes back to human nature. When when you are deciding how much mail you're going to drop this week, let's say it's today. Today's Friday. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, maybe you plan this afternoon to get your lead order in. And then you thought, hey, you know, that isn't going to affect me for another month. Uh, I'm, I'm going to do it Monday. <laughs> and then yeah. Monday you get busy. And then the next thing you know, a week goes by and you think, oh, yeah, I need to get my lead. Or maybe I'll add a little extra this week. And it's just, you end up being on this roller coaster sometimes. And when, once you get on a lead roller coaster, having leads, not having leads, having leads, not having leads, that also means you have cash flow and you have no cash flow. It absolutely sucks, Brad. I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not good. So no. try to balance that out, you know, week after week. Um, our most successful agents, somebody might disagree with this, but they have leads in their inbox 52 weeks a year. Yep. 
Now, they take vacations. Most every one of them takes at least two or three company-sponsored trips every year. Right. And they have uh, holidays, 4th of July, whatever. You know, but why, why do they do that? Why, why do they take, why does somebody take leads on a fixed price program on the week they're on vacation? They because they want that inventory. The, they're going to work them. That's right. When they come back from vacation, let's say they're working 30 leads a week, they can either shut off their leads that week if they're not thinking totally clearly through the process. Now, this is for somebody that's trying to build a business. I'm not talking about the well heeled agent that's been doing this for 20 years that, you know, just wants to take a week off and doesn't want to work any harder when they get back. There's nothing wrong with that person. Right. I, I admire them, but we're talking about agents that are right in final expense for one year, two years, three years, five years. That way, when they come back after their vacation or after Christmas or after whatever, and they're on 30 leads a week, they could work 45 leads a week for two weeks. Yeah. It won't change their day that much, but what they're going to find is at the end of the month, they make just as much money as if they'd been home and worked four weeks because they worked the same amount of leads. So they actually got to take a week off, and it was like it was a paid vacation. That, that's right. And, and I'll tell you, Brad, what I see is, um, to me, the lead having the leads come in like that, and like you said, even if you take some time off, like you know most of us do, um, especially around you know December. Um, December was one of my best months, and I didn't work. I didn't work a lot in December. Okay, right. and it was just uh, seeing the leads come in every week was security. That's the way I look at it. It's security to me because I know I've been. Uh, you know, I've got the training under my belt now. I've I've got my system down, and that to me the leads when I see them pop in like that, even if I'm not working that week. That's security to me because I know those are sales just waiting for me to tackle the bottom line. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then it's up to you as the business owner to decide what you want to do with your schedule. And you know what your expenses are. And you know, hey, if you let them sit there for a week and you think you can you can generate just about as much premium the week after, it's totally your call. Yep. You know, but at least the leads are sitting there waiting for you. And it's just a little thing that we we try to talk about, try to, because the, the gut reaction for everybody is, I'm going to be on vacation next week, don't send me leads. That's just the, yeah. that is what you do if you don't really necessarily think about it. And It messes the whole flow up, though. It messes the flow up. You, yeah. don't, want, you don't want to do it, guys. Trust me. You don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, it, does, it does. So, you know, hey, we still I still have people that, that, that do it that way, but but I but I say I go back to if you look at the people, or if I look at the people that I work with that I admire the most in terms of the production that they generate based mm-hmm. upon the leads that they take. Right. Those are the people that are just like they're just on autopilot. Right. And you know, and the other thing is too, man. This is something. I, Maybe you shouldn't bring up negatives. You know, some people would say that's a bad thing to do, but I think it's, I'd rather everybody just understands that, you know, there's, it's not like when you're on a 25 a week lead flow that every single solitary week of the year, there's 25 leads there. Right. You know, it goes like, back and forth sometimes. Come hell or high water, there's 25 leads there. Yeah, we could do it that way. We could build up a huge inventory for each agent and then everybody would be working month old leads. And, you know, hey, they'd have 25, and you know what? Maybe there wouldn't be any different. But you know, we try to manage it so that leads, you're either working leads that came in that week or maybe the week before. There's, there has to be a little cushion in there. Otherwise, right. you will have weeks where you wanted 25 and you got four. Exactly. And that that nobody wants. Um, so, you know, but there's going to be that little that little ebb and flow, just a little one. And, you know, what you, what you find is if you just take leads every week. It doesn't matter. It all, yeah. It all average. Out. It does. You know, you got so many leads you've never even got to, or you know, it, it's just it's just one of those things. But you know, overall, you know, we see people being pretty close. You know, most agents are within generally ten percent of what their goal is. Mm-hmm. Um, some under, some over. You know, we've got some agents that say, "Hey, if you get extras, I'll always you know set me up on twenty five, but I'd always take up to thirty. Right. So if we get a little bit of a rush in there, where where maybe we got a little better return than we than we anticipated, maybe they take a few extras for a week. But that's you know 
that that's each that's up to each individual agent. Good stuff. Good stuff. Well, look. Um, if there's any uh, closing thoughts, comments, uh, go ahead and hit it now. I um, again, I, I want to say I appreciate your time. It's probably been probably a little over an hour, and I know you got things to take care of to wind down the week, and I do too. And and I just wanted to say I, I appreciate your time, Brad, and putting this uh, this knowledge out there. So I'm gonna hand it over to you to give any final uh, closing thoughts on your end. Well, Matt, number one, you know, thanks for having me. Um, we've probably run a little little longer than we should have, but, you know, hopefully by now you know me well enough to know I, I am the king of I got some long answers to some short questions. So, you know, you can't help it, you know. Absolutely love this business and love the folks that we work with. And, and it's, it's so much fun to work with people that are, that are also trying to find their way right. either into the business or they're already in the business, but the program that they're plugged into just isn't working for them. Either there wasn't the training or a lot of times it was the leads or sometimes it, the contracts that they were in just weren't really to their, in their best interest. And, you know, that's an absolute blast. You know, all the stuff that we're talking about is, is a lot of fun, but it's only fun because of the people that we work with. And, you know, you've got to know a lot of these folks. You know, you are one of those folks that makes this business fun because that's really what it's all about. At the end of the day, it really is about the relationships of the people that you work with. I appreciate that, that is, Brad. That is yeah, it is really what it boils down to. It's it's not about a lot of times people come into this business, they think it's about the lead cost purely, the contract percentage purely. Uh, where can they go to get some training? Maybe I'll give this person over here one contract so that they'll train me, and then I'll go over here and do something different and mm -hmm. kind of a by hook or by crook kind of mentality. Early on, I think that's fairly natural because a lot of people come into this business having some pretty poor experiences that's right. in the business world in general, and we maybe built some bad habits in terms of kind of how we, we interact with folks. But I think what you see, though, is that in the end, in the end of the analysis of the people that are really having success, it really is more about the relationships and the people and. And everybody should be working in a place where they do enjoy the relationships and, and the people. And if somebody isn't enjoying the relationships and the people, and they don't think that their the person they're working with has their best interests at heart, they ought to move on. That's right. Just the, just the way it is. And, you know, because it really is about the relationships. Because I, you know, like I said, I love the people that we work with, and, and, and those are the folks that have helped build our business into kind of where it is and, and more importantly maybe even where it's headed it's about the people that are out in the field it's well, I'm about glad the you trainers mentioned that. and there is one one small little one small little thing too that I want to touch on just right quick and I forgot to ask you about <clears throat> or I wanted us, us both to kind of comment on real quickly the trust factor because you hear and see a lot of people that say don't let your IMO, you know, don't get your leads from your IMO. Don't get your leads from your... Well, I'm like thinking, well, isn't it a trust issue at that point? I mean, it, you, you've got to know that you're dealing with people that are trustworthy and that have their and your, you know, best interest at heart. And I think that gets lost a lot of times. Well, Matt, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something to you that's not very fair, and we haven't planned for this, so this, this probably isn't fair to you at all. But, you know, I got no problem with saying there was probably a time in your career and my career that you and I didn't necessarily see eye to eye. Mm -hmm. And I guess what I, without, without going into all that, part of it's public public knowledge you wouldn't have to dig too far to find it right and i think that's fine because i love i love that but what i what i really like to get at the heart at and it goes back to what you're talking about on trust is i'd like for you to say from the time that you thought what you thought to the time where you sit today and you think what you think now have myself or my company or any of the core
four people that we work with that you've come to know pretty well, yeah. some of them. Have any of those people changed a single solitary thing that they do or say from that time a few years ago that you had one perception to what you think now? Have have we changed? Absolutely. Anything we're doing? Absolutely not. It's all been the same from day one. And uh, that's why I'm proud to be here. I mean, it's, you know, it's been a learned experience, obviously. And it just comes down to, that's why I bang on that trust so much because I'm like, you know, you're good. these agents hear so many things and then it's, you know, I guess some just have to go through it. But I, I tell them, look, it's, it's about trust. You've got to trust. And when, when you finally know you've got that trust and you know you can trust the one you're dealing with that's got a lot of important aspects of your business at hand, then the only thing left to do is to knuckle down and get to work. So, yeah, absolutely. It's all been, you know, from... From what I heard third hand, and then I started meeting some of the people, and we kind of talked a few times. Everything that I've been told about the group has been right on. Never has changed, not one single bit. Uh, and I think that's, uh, I'm actually kind of glad maybe we're, we're ending with this. So for the people that, that stuck in there for the whole call, um, I think that's a, that's a nugget, and I think it's an, I think it's an important one, you know? Yep. Our business is, it's a very, 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 very public business. I tell people it's like operating a business in a fishbowl. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's looking at everything you're doing and picking apart, and every marketing group that's out there knows by name our top producers. Yeah. And everybody is, and it's just, it's, it is, it's a fishbowl. But you know, as an agent, and, and that's, the most important thing you know that's that's my perspective i love that because i love the fact when i talk to a new agent or agency more importantly on the agency side mm -hmm. if, if, if i'm talking with somebody that's got 5 10 15 20 agents i got no problem telling that person hey look i'm going to show you a place if you don't already know about it where you can go back and read every word i've written and everything that's been said about me and my business uh, since about 2008. Mm -hmm. Go look at the record and just see what was said, what was done, right. how were things handled. Um, is our business perfect, Matt? Lord, no. No, it's not perfect. Mistakes are made. That's, that's what happens when you deal with people. Yeah. You know, things happen. Um, but... You know, do we try to do our level best to address it if there's an issue, fix it if there's an issue, uh, take care of it in a way that, that people would appreciate? I'd like to think that that's, that that's always done, but that goes back to that trust thing. Like, right. you know, when something gets goofed up, do you try to fix it, or do you just, you know, just kick that person to the curb and, and not worry about it? You know, I I think we'd like to try to fix it. So, uh, so I love that. You know, I, I love... I love it being that way, and it's and it's been a blast, and it has changed. I think that's something new to the industry. It kind of goes back to that old boys club. It um, is, yeah. You know, yeah. <clears throat> yep. there, there's a lot of groups out there. Not to name, I'm not going to name names, but I'm just going to say there's a lot of groups out there that got a very, very, very bad reputation for one reason. There was no place for agents to access information. Right. Agents were just doing business with somebody that they sent them a postcard in the mail and they contracted and they didn't know anything about them. They didn't do any research on them. And then the next thing you know, you know, the company took away all their renewals, made them non-vested, or the company, you know, changed their commission level, or they terminated their contracts, or they, you know, all, all kinds of stuff that's happened to people. And the agent had no recourse. They just found a new group to work with or did something and, and had a bad taste in their mouth. But but now, in this information age the way it is now, there's tons of information out there right. and, and tons of talk. So you still have to kind of weed out the truth from the spin. That's harder to do for new people. But but still, if, you, if a person's paying attention, you know, you can find that there's there, there's several good places to go work 
you know, whether it's us or, you know, somebody else. And you got to have good training, consistent lead flow, fair contracts, and have a work ethic. And, you know, you can make a go of it in this business. Uh, but most importantly, you know, you want to be working with people that you trust and you think truly have your best interests at heart. And, you know, as long as you got that, you know, you're uh, you're going to have a lot of fun. So I think that's, uh, you know, unless you've got something else, you know, I think that's a good place good. to end it. <clears throat> yep, I do you too. Know, and uh, it's, been, it's been a lot of fun, man. I've, uh, I've really enjoyed doing it. And uh, hopefully we didn't uh, didn't bore people to tears too much. Oh, no. No, they'll enjoy it. And, I, and, and again... Brad, I, I, I very much appreciate your time, and uh, I know you got, like I said, I can only imagine what it's like in your office on a Friday, so <laughs> with that being said. It, it, it uh, is a little busy. You, you do know that about me. We're not, yeah. out, uh, we're not out playing golf on Friday afternoons, man. We, nope. You know, I love golf. We're never playing golf. It's usually <laughs> always, you know, making sure everybody's got leads and, and comp changes and, you know. Fixing other people's, fixing other people's and, mistakes. What's that? Fixing other people's mistakes. Well, yeah, that's that's part of. Hey, you know, as long as we as long as we have people involved in processes, yeah, uh, you know, there's always going to be. Uh, you know, I had a, we had an issue this week where you know, an agent sitting on an application, this big application with a carrier he didn't have, and and uh, you know, contracting got forwarded on, and it went into a black hole. Yeah, it happens and sometimes. We it on, and it went into a black hole, and. And the agent about came plum unglued um, <laughs> about the situation. But, you know, sometimes we do forget, like, there are people yeah. in these processes. And as long as we have that, there's going to be things that get goofed up. And you just have to keep dealing with it and working through it because it's not it's not all technology. You know, it's it's just the way it is. So it's it's one of the things that keeps it, it, keeps it interesting. It, that it, is, it, it that does. is for sure. It's, uh, but it, thank yeah, it's, it's that still requires people though, because it gives us, you know, gives you and I and everybody else a job. Yeah. Um, so it's like my last yeah. industry. I'll say this ending. It's like the last industry I was in, property management, and maintenance. I always said, you know, and this to me, this is a much better, a much better industry. Okay, much more fun, better, more profitable. But I always said to my wife, I always said, you know, this would be the perfect business uh, if it wasn't for people. <laughs> <laughs> But there's no way around it because that's who pays you. So yeah, <laughs> that, that, that's exactly right. You know, and you do have the ability though to to meet people that become you know great friends, yep. you know, for life, and people that you can really lean on. And you know, man, for a lot of our lives now, it's, it's actually become a little more detached from those relationships just because sometimes of technology. And, that's right. You know, it is cool though to have that. You know, still be able to have those those relationships and people that you lean on and people that you know. You know, if you're going to battle, you know, I know right now, you know, there's a dozen people. If I was going to battle, I got a dozen people that I would say, get in, come on. Yep. You know, let's go because you've they're battle tested. You know, you've been out there, you've been in the trenches with them, you've been there when the chips are down, you've been there when there's a problem, you've been there when things are great. So, you know, that's that's where you really know We're gonna Let keep it rock and rolling. We're gonna keep it rock and rolling. I, I appreciate your time, Brad, and I'll uh, get this uh, edited and posted and uh, send you a link. All right, man. All right. Like Thank you. Thanks, man. Bye bye. All right, bye bye. Well, there you go, guys. Another uh, great interview. I appreciate Brad spending his time with us. Uh, a lot of good information there. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. If you need anything, make sure to contact us at www.theleadjerk.com. Again. That's www.theleadjerk.com.